التعليم الإعلام والفضاء وأبحاثه وغيرها الكثير أما الآن فسننتقل إلى التكنولوجيا حيث التقت التكنولوجيا بالاقتصاد يأخذنا زيشان أوبال الرئيس التنفيذي للعمليات في شركة يلدرس للتمويل التكنولوجي الإسلامي ليحاول رجاء المزروعي نائب الرئيس التنفيذي لشركة فنتك هايف في سلطة مركز دبي المالي العالمي وخالد سعد الرئيس التنفيذي لخليج البحرين للتكنولوجيا المالية البحرين ودكتور عاشا خانة المدير التنفيذي لشركة أدو أي آي ونايميش شاه رئيس قسم الابتكار والتكنولوجيا الناشئة في بنك الإمارات دبي الوطني في الجلسة الأخيرة لهذا اليوم والتي ستأتي تحت عنوان الفنتك لقاء تكنولوجيا بالخدمات المالية لذا أرجو منهم التوجه إلى المنصة وأرجو منكم الترحيب بهم فأهلا وسهلا Welcome our speakers and moderators for to the stage Hello, hello, assalamu alaikum everybody uh, My name is Zeeshan Opal, I'm co-founder at Yildiz um, Yildiz is the first FCA regulated Islamic fintech platform out of the UK uh, and effectively what we do is provide real estate investment opportunities to everybody anywhere in the world using technology for me, this really describes what fintech is. Um, the democratization of finance, uh, lowering the barriers to entry to traditionally inaccessible financial and investment tools. Um, I'm joined today by an esteemed panel of guests who are also very heavily involved in fintech. So if you could just start by introducing yourselves and give me a short description of what fintech means to you. Hi, my name is Naimish Shah. I head the innovation and emerging technologies for Emirates MBD and also uh, partnerships, so meaning that we, we try to work as much as possible with fintechs, uh, leverage on their nimbleness and their capabilities rather than building on our own. So for us, it's, it, it's very simple. Uh, whatever brings value to the organizations faster is what fintech means to us. Hi, um, I run an enterprise AI solutions firm and we work with a number of insurance companies and banks to build uh, artificial intelligence models for new kinds of credit scoring, for anti-money laundering, for various kinds of digitization and automation uh, processes in the bank. I'm Khalid Saad here. I run Bahrain's first dedicated fintech hub, and it's a platform from which to ideate, co-create, incubate, and collaborate and develop the ecosystem in Bahrain and extending that into the region. For me, uh, fintech is really a mindset of doing things very differently. Hi, my name is Rajal Mazroui. I'm the executive vice president of Fintech Hive at the DIFC. Fintech Hive is the first and largest fintech accelerator in the region. We're an acceleration program. We bring fintechs from all over the world and we engage them in conversations with financial institutions to achieve um, some sort of collaborative ideas that would uh, benefit the uh, financial institutions from leveraging on these technologies that are offered by the fintechs. Thank you very much. Um, I actually wanted to start with, with you, Roger, at the end. Um, so recently, the DIFC signed 10 memorandums of understanding uh, with leading fintech hubs globally. What were you looking to achieve with that? And uh, you know, what is the premise of the DIFC signing these MOUs? And what do you anticipate that, that leading to? So uh, we've signed 10 uh, MOUs with global fintech hubs, including uh, Bahrain Fintech Bay and uh, accelerators, because we would like to unlock the opportunities for fintechs globally from and out to outside of the region. So when we uh, engage with these hubs, we uh, promote each other's initiatives. We look for information about what trends of fintechs are emerging in those markets, and if there are any opportunities for any of our partners to access a technology that's offered in uh, Africa or in Asia, we are able to connect with them and uh, engage them in conversations with our uh, partners. Fantastic. And I, I see that opens a, a window of opportunity. And, and, and Khalid, obviously, one sign with Bahrain. What, what do you feel that that will bring to Bahrain and your ecosystem there? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, to, to Rajah's point, I think the, with the development, obviously, of FinTech globally and, and, and Bahrain specifically, um, we feel there's a very much different vibe about how to do things. And I think people have come to a realization that the modus operandi has changed. We've got to adopt to a world where 
you know, there's all rapid changes. We don't know what's going to be happening over the next few months. But it's, again, I go back to that point where it's, it's the mindset that we need to do things very differently. And I think more importantly also, we don't do things in silos, but we do things collaboratively. And I think what a lot of people fall into the trap of is painting uh, anything they do as a zero-sum game. And I think that that is where, for me, fintech is fundamentally not only changing the way we look at things in Bahrain, but also the way we work with um, the UAE, with other countries, and it's the same thing happening here and elsewhere. And, and so I think uh, it, it is driving a fundamental shift, underlying shift in the way corporates, individuals, and the whole ecosystem is working and dealing with rapid technological change and disruption. Fantastic. Um, Aisha, that leads me nicely onto a question for you. So, I mean, you spent 10 years on Wall Street and, and traditional financial institutions, and now you're working within the fintech space. What, what are the, the major differences for you from a, from a traditional financial outfit to, to fintech and the fast-paced changing environment that, that we currently find ourselves in? Yeah, I mean, I think that I worked a lot in investment banks and trading, and actually um, in trading and algorithmic trading especially, which was the area that I worked in, we were already using quantitative models and technology to actually drive markets and understand markets. The retail business was always far behind. And uh, it, whether it came to wealth management, investment management, there was a lot of manual work. There was not enough data analytics or data understanding. And so what we see now in, in Singapore and in New York and the other hubs is that there has been an an understanding of the fact that you need to serve your customers wherever they are, provide them the services that they need, and make it a completely seamless data-driven experience that personalizes the services that are offered to them. Um, and I think that this is the big difference, whereas the customer is much more in control, it's much more customer-centric now, that's one area, and the other is there's a lot more automation and data-driven, whether it's trade finance or anything else. So I think that the those both from the operations side and from the consumer facing side, it's really exciting to see these changes. Yeah, I think just to add to that as well, change in traditional financial institutions is, is very difficult. There's a lot of red tape. It's, it's hard to do when the fast changing pace environment of, of fintechs, you know, things change on an almost daily basis. So I think that's fantastic. Um, Namish, with the Emirates MBD, you recently have been recognized at uh, an award center ceremony as the leader of innovation uh, in the Middle East. Um, but what is being done at Emirates MBD to drive innovation and change? Uh, I think thanks to our senior leadership who, uh, who, who solely believe in innovation and they have included innovation as a part of the DNA in everything what they do. Now, I must say that it is not easy. Yeah. After all, we are a 50-year-old bank. There are legacy. There's a lot of legacy which we have to work towards. So I think they have a concept of two speed things. You know, one is something which you take care of. Uh, you do your BAU, you meet your regulatory requirements, but then they have carved up a team which also looks at the future emerging technologies or business trends, and then try to marry your business use case, solve a problem and bring it back to your uh, BAU bank where they see value. For them, it's all about seeing value. Either it's in terms of uh, operational efficiencies, alternative new business models, new revenue channels, or customer engagement. Uh, I think very, uh, against these four key themes, we craft our problem statements, work with partners like DIFC FinTech Hive, and now I've been introduced to FinTech Bay Bahrain, uh, and take their help in identifying the right partners who might be able to solve our problems faster. That does not mean that we don't work with, because there are so many names, right? You, you have all these jargons. You have big tech, you have tech fin, you have fintech. <laughs> Uh, you have startups. Ultimately, he's a partner. Deliver value. We support you. Uh, you know, we incubate you if you're very early uh, at the early stage because you have a very strong value proposition, and we move forward. Fantastic. Um, just thinking about challenges that fintechs face, and from a personal experience in the UK, one of the biggest issues is the SME lending gap. So funding when looking at, at, at fintechs. What are the 
the, the biggest problems faced in this region for, for fintechs. And I'm going to open the floor up with that one. So whoever feels to, to jump in on an answer to that, please. So we looked at uh, the startups here in the region. And for them to really grow, they need uh, regulation, they need funding, and they need an enabling working environment and access to financial institutions who would definitely use their technologies proven they're working. So we tried at the DIFC okay. to create an inclusive ecosystem of different uh, components and partners to enable this. So we are uh, participating with 21 financial institutions who've opened their doors, their platforms, and their minds to innovation and uh, engaged with the fintechs that we have attracted to look at their technology and how can they help them either grow independently or test their products within the banks. And the regulators at the DFSA launched the innovation testing license, which is the equivalent of the sandbox, except we don't call it sandbox here because we're in the desert. <laughs> and uh, the innovation testing license currently enables funding, lending, um, uh, activities, wealth tech, uh, payments is coming. So we have a progressive regulator that's looking at trends globally, other regulations, and starting to adapt what works for the region. The IFC also launched a $100 million fund for investment in fintech, and this is the commitment from the financial center to support this sector. So this fund will be available to fintechs in the region or outside the region, uh, and we'll start uh, accepting applications for that uh, early next month. On top of that, we have uh, uh, created a special subsidized license for fintechs. They're small, they can't compete with the financial institutions, so we give them uh, subsidized commercial licenses and uh, flexible uh, uh, work offices and work options to operate from the financial center. And with this, we have seen more than 50 fintechs established in the financial center now in the co-working space as either part of the program or part of the co-working space. And uh, we've seen uh, really uh, good results. We've run the accelerator for two years, and so far we have about 28 proofs of concepts in total. Uh, four of them were recently completed during the program, and two of them are actually live. So we're really proud to see those results. They're tangible. You can see the impact that you are uh, supporting uh, in the lives of these uh, startups, and you can see them grow. And if they need funding, then other than the $100 million fund from the DIFC, we have about 16 VCs and funds that are part of our ecosystem. They know about any fintech that come to the, to the center. They get the first chance to speak to them, evaluate their businesses, and inject funds as needed. I think just to build up on Raja's point, if we look at just purely financing as opposed to actually investments, and I, the, the problem in the region, and it's somewhat not even only constrained to the region, but I think for a lot of places is there is no distinction between what is an SME and what is a startup. And there, there, banks have no clue how to distinguish between the two. And usually if you go to a bank and say, listen, you know, I'm a tech startup, I need some financing, you know, give me three years audit statements, give me this, give me that. The way they're going to value your business, the people doing that don't really understand the nature of tech yep. startups. And so I think one, that's an issue, especially um, for a lot of, you know, especially tech startups that want to grow. But I think the, therein lies the opportunity and the availability of alternative platforms such as crowdfunding and others that have realized that you know traditional financial institutions are not going to fill in this gap or definitely if they were going to fill it it's not going to happen in the short to medium term and uh, this is why there are, there are these alternatives but it is an issue um, the, the investments as Raja rightly mentioned are growing people are starting to look at these things for investments but in terms of pure financing, there is still a very big gap from traditional institutions. Yeah. And I think in general, SME financing is a huge problem, not just for tech companies, but for um, any, any uh, Asia, Middle East, Latin America, Africa. You have uh, a lot of small businesses that just don't, are, are so-called thin file businesses, so you don't have enough data on them to give them a credit score there is so much opportunity that banks were not willing to take a risk on. But startups have been using artificial intelligence, alternative data, and then our clients that happen to be some of the largest banks in South Asia and in Singapore are now looking at it as well. And they're thinking about 
what are other ways that we can understand the financial risk of this uh, SME? Can we look at the profiles of its founders? Can we look at receivables? Can we look at the way they do accounting? Can we look at how often they travel? Can we look at all of these different variables that are non-traditional sources of data? That's why data is, is a most powerful asset, not just what you have within the bank as a transaction data or credit history, but all the wealth of data that lies outside. And that is what is very exciting. And I'm interested to see that now, it's interesting to see that banks are, are actively now looking at this as well. I'm Anything? the only bank, so no comments. <laughs> I, I suppose that leads me nicely onto my next question. Khaled, you touched upon it as fintech being described as a disruptor. Um, I've heard it being described as an enabler in other senses. From, from a banking perspective, how do you perceive fintech and, and what does it look like from, a, from an internal banking perspective? As an en enabler, for sure. I don't, we don't see them as competition. Anymore. You're not worried? No, I don't. So when we think about in the UK, for example, we've got unicorns all of a sudden, Revolut, Monzo Bank, challenger banks popping up everywhere. Partner with them. So you know, cannibalize your own business rather than being killed at a later stage. So I, cooperation that's very is good the to only, hear. There's only way. See, it's not easy for fintechs to operate on their own. Right? They also need support from us. I think it's a two-way relationship from uh, both fintech side and the bank side. And only through cooperation, I, they will become the unicorns they are and bank will also get leverage on them. As everybody rightly said, it's going to take time for banks to change immediately, especially in terms of lending. SMEs have a lot of uh, friction in, in, this, in this part of the world. Our risk assessment or risk uh, management methods have to change. But we also have to think a little bit from their side. They are here to prote protect the customer's money. Right? Now, unnecessary lending can lead to high NPLs, which can also result in um, bad economic conditions. So a very, very fine balancing act is required while we support uh, the fintechs and the startups. Uh, bank has to protect, the, they are the custodians of public, public's money. Sure. They need, they need to have this fine balancing act. I think they should carve out, uh, which we are working very heavily with our team, carve out a pool of money, you know, take a calculated risk and then experiment with it. And based on what results they get, they can start changing their policies and frameworks. That's Ali. what. Yeah, I, I was. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> now, I was going to say the banks are quite important to the fintech ecosystem because a number of the balance sheets provide, are provided by banks. So you have these peer to peer lending groups or other fintechs, or so behind the scenes, it's either banks or private equity firms or VCs that are funding them. And we have seen that this risk management is actually quite important, which is why in China, it is now the government has been systematically shutting down these kind of bad fintech players, which were these P2P lending companies that just took money and then disappeared. Yeah. So you, know, this, this, you can't have a completely wild west when it comes to banking, because you have to be custodians of people's hard-earned savings. Absolutely. I think to Namisha's point, and, and you know, I, I take EMBD as one of the very progressive institutions, not only in the region but globally when it comes to experimentation. I think the risk for um, a lot of the very traditional incumbents that are here is once they get to grips with the reality of you know the way the world works, they're very heavily services oriented. We're now in an experiential world, and I think this is where a lot of the fintechs. It's all about collaboration, but I think for a lot of incumbents, the slower they move, the more that pie is going to shrink very significantly. You can ultimately also collaborate, but I think the more you realize very quickly that you know, you gotta move back to the basic utilities of what people really need, but package that in a very nice experience. And I think therein lies the opportunity immediately of collaborating with um, FinTechs. What I always say is a lot of banks think that um, or traditional institutions, being innovative or fintech is putting a nice application or a facade, but then what happens on the back is pretty much old school. And I always joke and say it's like having a Bugatti Veyron, you open the hood and there's a 1980s diesel engine. And I think this is what we need to avoid. And I think the example of EMBD about 
APIs, literally overhauling the ethos and the way the bank works is, is definitely the path forward. And fintechs need the scale to, that banks have. I, I, I agree, and I think you, know, you, you look at, at fintechs and using yield as an example, we've got a very small team uh, you know, operationally. We've invested very heavily in technology to, to deal with all the back office functionalities that a bank would probably employ a, a massive team to do so. Um, and I think that investment in technology for us has really helped drive our, our, our business forward and pass savings that we make as a business onto our end, end consumer. At the end of the day, it's looking at the retail element of, of our business and saying, how can we improve a, a traditionally inaccessible financial tool or investment tool and, and pass them savings on, on to investors? Um, how do you think banks are going to cope with that operational change? Uh, so, we, uh, like, thanks for the compliment of being progressive. Our board recognizes this. If you don't change today, you won't exist tomorrow. So the bank board is consciously, and it's a public information so I can share with you, has launched a billion dirham digital transformation program, not only to change the facades, but also create a complete digital journey end to end be more demodularized, go to OpenStack from technology transformations, um, you know, go, I mean, just monolithic applications are out. And then open banking. Open app banking, APFying everything, and converting APFying into products, which you partners with others. It's all platform economy now. You'll have, it, it, the world of, it, it, it's not only, uh, you know, competition now. It's about sharing economy. You have to work together to generate. So that's where they're investing heavily and we'll be ready in about three years' time to completely open up, though we are not mandated by PSD2 or uh, as UK, but we are doing it as an opportunity to grow rather than being buying, uh, rather than being mandated by a regulation. I, I mean, I think for, that's, that's for example, fantastic. We have a very small team. A bank, and this would be completely... Uh, a so, surprise for you guys as well, right? It's a rocket taking off. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we have a team, and we recently gave a talk at JITEX about quantum computing, our research and R&D unit, talking about quantum computing. So one of the senior managers asked, oh, we are a bank, what are you doing? What do we have to do with quantum computing? You're not IBMs or R&D big techs. Then we explained to them, it is important to keep a tap on this, because if you don't keep a tap on this, all the investment you, because the, the future of computing is quantum. If you're not ready, when that market is ready, you will have, you know, you will be lagging behind. They understood it and then gave us the freedom to, uh, and invested in our research, to be ready within three, four, five years when quantum computing hits us. So it's gonna break all securities in the world if quantum computing comes and we're not ready with it. So but that's a, it's all about mindset and thought leadership, right? From the, it, it was driven from the top. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess we can see why why you're winning awards for for innovation, then, right? <laughs> Sorry, Raja, you was, you were going to add something. I just want to build on that. Um, you know, from my experience with the institutions in the program. So uh, last year, when we first ran the uh, program, we had um, 11 financial institutions in the program, and we barely were scratching the surface when we go to the banks and we talk about fintech and we talk about innovation, and they have no idea what we're talking about, and they think that we're going to talk for a while and then disappear. But then we came back the following year and we ha doubled the number of the financial institutions, doubled the number of the applications we received for the programs, and tripled the number of POCs that evolved, which means that we have been able to touch base with these institutions and enable this collaboration. The first time we spoke to them, I didn't think that they would actually engage. However, uh, moving forward and progressing from last year, uh, we have seen uh, better opportunities for collaboration. They are aware that all of these changes are coming. Regulations are changing. Uh, digital payments and uh, all of these regulations will enable fintechs to go head to head with the institutions. But they have the advantage of being out there in the market for X numbers of years. So if they don't change, they will miss out on this uh, journey. Definitely. I mean, just uh, aligned to that, and I think the exponential growth fintech has seen, I mean, we were talking about it just before 2016, Yield has attended uh, the WIBC conference. Uh, there was a 15-minute segment to fintech at the end of the last day. And now, you know, the rhetoric's completely changed in this region, and 
there's so many events and so much happening in terms of driving this forward. In terms of that growth, what do you think that needs to be done to, to control it, to measure that growth and to ensure that growth is, is being used correctly? Well, look, I think um, one is you've got to break down the ecosystem into, I call it, blocks. For us, what I think moved the needle first was the education process, especially with the regulator, uh, in terms of, and you, you know how regulators are, they are inherently risk averse by nature. Anything you know, ex exotic is not welcome. And that takes some time. And in our case, you know, it had to start well over two years ago. Singapore took the bold step of appointing a chief fintech officer, which, you know, that's a very different way of doing things. Um, and then, you know, the, the ball started rolling down. The regulator opening up actually forces the ecosystem to wake up too. And I remember years ago when we were a few individuals saying, the world is changing, you got to be ready for it. Um, the regulators were not ready at that time. The institutions thought we were completely out of our depth. Um, but the reality is the moment the regulator also realized that this is important, the barriers of pro that protected the incumbents have gone down. And so fast forward, not only um, is, are there tons of companies in the sandbox at the moment? If I take the example of at least Bahrain, we have 23 companies, and none of them are your typical financial institutions. And then recently there was a consultation on open banking. I mentioned we're talking about PSD2. This is a very different world, which a lot of people are used to. Now, in terms of the populace or educating the population, a lot of people hear about fintech. They necessarily might not understand what it is. A lot of people might think fintech, artificial intelligence, all of these things, we're going to lose our jobs tomorrow morning. But I think it's just understanding what does it mean for me as an individual, what does it mean for us collectively, what does it mean for the ecosystem. And I, I see now that a lot of people are embracing that change. They're saying, you know what, what got us here is not going to get us there and we need to change. And in our part of the world, and you know, increasingly also in Asia, it's, it's governments and you know, the regulators that are aggressively forcing that change in behavior. Well, it's maybe in the West, you've got the private sector. So I think you know, it started off, it always starts with individuals, but uh, the main step is education. And for us, the tipping point was that regulator said, I'm going to change. And then at a country level, we have a cloud-first policy which says the whole government is going to move to the cloud. So then that also is a key enabler to doing a lot of things. And obviously then we've got things from Tech Hive and others, you know, all the key building blocks that help this ecosystem not only grow but thrive. And so it, it takes time, but it starts, I think, in my opinion, at least for us, started there. I think that's a really good point about the fact that in the emerging markets, especially not the westernized markets so much where the private sectors develop, you see the government being very proactive across Asia, across the Middle East. The progressive governments are pushing change. Um, you know, Singapore has a cloud native architecture approach as well for services 4.0. And of course, they took a very big step in fintech. But we see that it, just coming to artificial intelligence, over 100 company, countries now have an AI strategy, starting obviously uh, inspired very much by China, which has a three-year strategy, and then France does, the others do. But um, while all the countries do, we see that some countries are actually operationalizing it. And that's really where we see a lot of um, the ecosystem growing and uh, the banks also beginning to wake up to it. Then you have also some kind of banks that really stand out. In Singapore, DBS has really stood out um, as a bank where from the beginning when I met Piyush, who's a CEO six, seven years ago, he always wanted a digital first bank. And so there was a, I was with the head of innovation on a panel yesterday, and they said that they had been in India for you know, 10 years, and they had 100 and like literally 40,000 accounts. And then they said, you know what, we're gonna shut down our seven branches and we're gonna allow people to pay and, and pay for certain things at local coffee shops and others 
by integrating into their system, and they got 14 million accounts in just 10 months. Wow. <laughs> so they, it's, it's been a huge success story where they just took a huge risk and they invested in this um, Israeli US company called Casisto, where the, instead of the branch manager, there's an AI agent that actually understands everything that, uh, that, and provides all the information to Indian customers. So that kind of risk taking really takes bold leadership as well. I think I just want to add a quick point to what you yeah. mentioned. I, and I remember visiting DBS Asia X and obviously yeah. it, it took Piyush Gupta as the CEO to do it. And I think the shift, and you, you mentioned this Nimish also, it's you should see this transformation in technology, not as an investment where you're going to pump in money and expect 7 or 8% return in a few months. You should see it as a strategic imperative. That, you know, if you don't do it, then you're going to be in trouble. And so I think that's also a, a cultural shift. And innovation is not centered in the IT department or centered in one area. It is embedded completely in the fabric of the institution at different levels. So that's also, I think, another key point. I think it's uh, worth mentioning that the Prime Minister of the UAE launched the UAE National Innovation uh, Agenda in 2014 and Smart Dubai was launched in the same year, and they have a mandate to move the government transactions on the blockchain by 2021, mm -hmm. which is very aggressive, and they're progressing really well and engaging with all the government and the financial institutions to achieve that. And I don't know, Aisha, if you know, we have a minister for artificial intelligence yes, here in the Yes, I UAE. met him. <laughs> yeah, so that's really, uh, you know, uh, key, and the strong yeah. alignment from the government, which is really leading the private sector right. in the region. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, it's, it's great to see in, in regions like that, but do, do you think that it, it potentially also boils down to the unbanked developing economies within these regions as well? You know, more people have mobile phones in these regions than, than bank accounts. And, and obviously, governments recognizing that and pushing the rhetoric around financial technology, fintech, to be able to provide a service for, for the unbanked. Yeah, absolutely. I think the mobile phone has now become the gateway to financial services which, by the way, were very unjustly kept away from people. Uh, if you think of women or you think of any of the underdeveloped sectors of the economy, uh, finan finance or capital markets have never been accessible to them because uh, they didn't have a bank account. But now because of their phone, and by the way, the data that you can get from the phone is so useful in understanding their risk profile and giving them insurance at the r right time. For instance, we were working on a product where, you know, farmers who live between $1 and $4 a day, that's the majority of farmers in the world, um, they have no insurance. And so if there's a typhoon or if there's a earthquake or if too many rains or too few rains, they lose so much of their financial flows. And there was no way to validate the destruction by any one of these uh, catastrophes. But now you can use satellite imagery and deep learning to immediately verify that, in fact, if there was a flood, how much of the crop was destroyed. And once you can verify it, you can automatically do claims processing. So it opens up so much opportunity for especially these uh, underserved communities by using deep tech with financial services. Fantastic. Uh, just touching on, on Emirates MBD and their, their view of the, the, the technology element of it and, and your traditional element of banking and your traditional finance not being accessible to, to the masses um, versus the innovation of, of fintech being accessible. So is there anything being done to potentially change that? So uh, again, it was an experimentation, right? So we launched our first digital only bank which is called Live Dot, uh, sometime in 2017. Yeah, it was an experiment. We were not sure whether we would get ad adoption. It was specifically targeted towards 18 to 25, 18 to 30 kind of people, where the wallet size is very, very small. Right? Uh, no checkbooks, completely digital. No going to branches. There's no call, call, call center. Nothing. Surprisingly, what we see after about 15, 18 months is our new acquisition of customers. Uh, on a monthly basis is higher on live than a traditional bank. So that is giving us a lot of insights and like, like Aisha mentioned, yeah, data is everything. Right? Um, and with that insight, we are also taking the learnings what we got from with this isolated experiment to our traditional bank. So Fantastic. try to uh, bring in the knowledge which we got here to open account digitally completely 
on a traditional bank is a work in progress now. So slowly and steadily, we experiment. We uh, we understand what the market is like, what's the pulse of the customer, uh, and then bring it back to the traditional bank. So that we solved for probably customers who were not able to open accounts with the traditional bank with a minimum balance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Lib does not require anything of that sort. Right? Brilliant. And wallet size can be as uh, zero as possible. And the most important part was uh, the lifestyle element. It was completely lifestyle based and banking happened to be a service, additional service for us on that side. That's one part. From SMEs, there are two challenges, SMEs versus startup. One is SME generally, it's, it's a very difficult for them to open accounts. We recognize that. And the bank is trying to work and find solutions where, again, if we have some valuable data insights, how can we reduce this friction between the banks, and the SMEs and the start, startup guys? It's not going to be easy, but uh, we have started on this journey where uh, using data and valuable insights, whether we can uh, streamline this process to help the economy at large. The second thing is from startup point of view, the challenge is to engage them. So we have a model called for fintech engagement called SEED, S-triple-E-D, right? Scout, engage, you know, evaluate, experiment, production. 90% of the fintechs fall at the second E itself. Right? So we again learn from this. Why is this happening? Right? I must say this, um, with all due respect, that uh, sometimes fintech, startup word is being used as a fashion statement. Uh, I agree. They have not thought through completely, but they want to join the bandwagon to start do this. Uh, there are a new startup, they come to the banks, and even with one or two questions, they fall apart. So, but that's a filtering process, right? Our biggest challenge was how to even get them to our procurement process. They couldn't even far pass the gate one. So we created something called a lean process called FinTech Playbook, where uh, with working with legal and procurement and at least get them engaged with us. Then we developed them. So these are some transformation changes which we're doing in our processes to facilitate uh, engagements with fintechs in a much better way than uh, had we not yeah. done it a couple of years back. It's fantastic. It's almost you're learning from one another. Um, I, I think that's a great opportunity because, as you said, a lot of fintechs come into it thinking, great fintech, I want to be part of this great buzzword and, and, and don't actually have any backing to what, what they're saying. It's we want to be involved and that's where the buck stops. So it's good to see that you know, banks and fintechs are, are, are learning from one another. Absolutely. Um, one point I wanted to touch on, and, and this is something that we've discussed over in the UK as well, is, is the regulation element. So um, uh, a point that was made on another panel I was discussing this on was, is it possible to apply the regulation used in traditional financial institutions? So, you know, with the FCA, the regulation that they apply to fintechs. And initially, when the growth wasn't so big, that, that was exactly what was happening. We went through a, a two-year process with the FCA to become regulated, looking at our institution as a financial institution, but maybe that's not a benefit for, for fintechs. They're not going to be learning and that, that, you know, that knowledge sharing is, is not happening. So what is being done in this region with, with the regulators to break down those barriers and, and help with the regulation? So it's uh, honestly a learning process for the regulators. We need to educate the regulators about the technology so that they can regulate it. If they can use traditional regulation, then there's nothing innovative about this technology. But the good thing is that once they uh, regulate one activity, then that can be applied in different uh, engagements. Uh, the sandbox is a good idea to test all of these regulations. So the way the DFSA does it is that they give a license uh, with a limited period, about uh, 12 to 18 months to these startups to test their product. They have a limitation on the number of transactions, number of clients, uh, value of funds that they are collecting on those uh, transactions, and they monitor them very closely. Within 12 months, 18 months, they need to finalize that regulation and award that regulation to this company and then any subsequent. So we have a robo-advisory that went through that process with the DFSA. A company called Sarwa joined our first program. Now they're licensed and now we have the robo-advisory uh, regulation available for more robo-advisors to come. Uh, uh, this cohort, we have a, a Sharia-compliant robo-advisor from Saudi Arabia. 
who join the program, they can definitely build on that regulation, but they need to look at the Sharia part of it. So as I earlier mentioned, it's progressive. Uh, but once um, you do that regulation, the first time you can definitely use it. The other thing is collaboration, and the DFSA have signed MOUs with many regulators globally, and they're also part of the FCA Global Sandbox to uh, collaborate on these regulations that work somewhere else in the world. So if they're working in the UK, we look at them and find a way to make them work within our um, uh, region and then take it from there. So it's still a learning curve for the regulators, but they are pushed by the industry, by the government, by the startups, by everyone to actually regulate these activities because everybody wants access to these activities. I think uh, Rajam mentioned a good point. It's an, uh, the example of Sarwa is, I think, important because you can have the sandbox but you need an exit mechanism and a very clear route of where you're going. And I think that also forces the regulator to not only figure out what the technology is doing and how they should best regulate this, also keeping in mind best practices and what works locally, but also within a certain time frame, they need to come out with a clear route of how things go. And the moment you go through that motion, that changes the way you think, especially when it comes to a lot of technologies. And I, I think, you know, Historically, regulators, if you went to them wanting to do something regulated without a license that they have, they either reject you or try and re-engineer an existing license, which I think doesn't work. And I think also at the same time, um, it also opens the minds of regulators that there are certain things with technology that they initially thought should be regulated, do not really need regulations. Um, and, and so it's, we're starting to see that there is an ethos shift and also, I think the point that Raja mentioned um, about the Global Innovation Framework and MAS is also part of it. Mm -hmm. I think this is the first proper time where you've got cross-jurisdictional, um, possibly, hopefully, potentially passporting. You know, the EU does it very well. Yeah. The, yep. But then you, you've got Europeans, you've got us in the Middle East and Asia, all really putting hands together, trying to figure out what is a global, I think, conundrum or issue to tackle. And so it's, I think, an interesting time. I think another thing that's important is that fintech regulation can't be done in isolation. There is data regulation and algorithmic regulation now. Data governance and the data privacy acts, uh, fintech, uh, any fintech needs to be compliant with that. And now uh, in Singapore, for instance, we have an ethics committee also that looks in bias and algorithms. So because of the deep tech technologies and the profuse amounts of data that is used in fintech, some of their intersecting regulations are also very important to keep in mind. Anything to add from a, a, a banking perspective in terms of regulation? Patience and persistence. <laughs> now, I agree, as I said, we, two years, it took us two years of speaking to the FCA on an almost weekly basis for them to, to understand our business work with them to, to understand our technology and how it all worked. It was, it was a very interesting process. And I think being the first of, of our kind within the, within the countries has, has paved that way and others have come after us. And I think that's, that is what's happening in this region as well, as, as you mentioned, Marja, when one company gets regulated, it helps the others to, to benefit from that. It, it's just a bit harder on the first one, I guess, isn't it? But congratulations on your hard work and success. <laughs> Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Um, I did want to touch on, on digital payments. Now, we, we've spoken about regulation, and you know it's, it's clear for everybody to see that even traditional financial institutions have failed in terms of their regulatory objectives. Um, when looking at money laundering, for example, you've got the likes of HSBC, Deutsche Bank, that have been fined heavily for their failures in, in money laundering controls and regulations. Um, what do you think that, that digital payments, um, the blockchain, and cryptocurrencies and, uh, and everything fancy around that is, is going to do for, the, for this element of, of transparency and, and ensuring everybody is, is doing what they said that they should be doing effectively? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I, th I think I, it goes back to the principle that you mentioned earlier. It's the democratization of financial services. And I think if you traditionally just restrict this to the banks, then you get same old, same old. And now I think we, we live in a world where 
you know, a lot of the payments are done peer to peer. And again, you go back to the point of mentioning the unbanked. I think the problem with a lot, a lot of people with the unbanked is the traditional financial model. And by extension, the payments uh, infrastructure has miserably failed people. And I think now with, with the mobile phone, the device, mm -hmm. that capability of doing it is even better. And I think to add to the blockchain, and we have seen this especially with money changers. Money changers, you know, charge an arm and a leg just to transfer money and you know even traditional financial institutions and I, sometimes what happens is it's it's quicker for me to take a suitcase of cash <laughs> go all the way to San Francisco and deliver it in person than <laughs> the current system um, and, and, and I think now is the time that we go around that and also not only do it cheaper but more seamless and I think instantaneous and I think that has you know, I think opened up a lot of avenues. We, we see there are a lot of companies that started as a payment service providers. You know, we've got Paytm in India, there's uh, mm -hmm. WeChat, Alipay, all of these guys, they've now become not only just as payments or rails for payments, they've become the financial institutions of the future. Um, uh, and, and so I think payments infrastructure is the rails for a lot of things that could happen. And I think that's an area where we need to develop further. And PESA is a fantastic example of where financial institutions failed miserably. Now over 90% are using mobile phones for that. So there's a lot, a lot of innovations are happening there. But I think also, let me add on one point, we see a lot of um, companies, and I'm sure Raja, you've seen this tremendously from your programs, um, are too focused on C to C, customer to customer. I think that massive opportunity is on the payments infrastructure side. And you know, providing platforms which can enable individuals and businesses to really connect to this global financial ecosystem. But I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that, uh, speaking of payments, we have to look at where do people find it easiest to do payments? So one place, which is the number one pain point in all cities is transportation. So now you have transport companies, at least in Asia, that are essentially becoming banks. So if you look at Grab or you look at Gojek, which are the two of the biggest in Asia and Southeast Asia, they have decided because it's so, because the, the users are constantly paying for rides. Now they're adding other things. You can pay, of course, with Uber Eats, we saw you can pay for food delivery. Now you can pay for something else. The other thing that we see is, of course, uh, e-commerce companies are also becoming, because you're constantly paying. If you're paying for them, then you can also get a credit card through the same way. So now we see Amazon uh, trying to give loans out at the same time. So or telco is trying to do that because they have access to people and they're paying and they're buying uh, SIM cards or they're buying, uh, we've seen that with Geo, Reliance gave such an incentive, uh, such a low payment to access data that they had huge growth in the number of users. Now when you have such a big user base and they're paying for data, they can also pay for other things. So what payments is really the lifeblood of the economy and we see the challengers to the incumbents, not being these challenger little fintechs that are growing like Monzo and others, but other companies like in logistics, like in transport, like in telco, e-commerce, that are good at payments. And now they feel that if they're good at payments, they can do everything else around that payments infrastructure uh, as well. Now they, they, the areas they can't get into, of course, are trading and other things like that. But as far as payments and trade finance, they're actively getting into that. So payments is a core function of the bank, right? So we've experimented with uh, blockchain for cross-border remittance with India, with a partner bank, uh, ICICI. It works well. It works very well. It was real-time, good experience. But then uh, when we did a value analysis, how is it different from doing a direct uh, API to API connection? So making these decisions, however, solve the customer's problem first. Blockchain can come later or whatever can come, technology come later. Yeah. So we, 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 we have our own direct remittance network. We realize that 
highest number of payments, cross-border payments happens to the subcontinent, right? Yeah. So from uh, the, the remittances is about 30 billion per annum to the subcontinent with India and Philippines being the highest, right? So we did establish direct, we eliminated in any intermediary. We established our own direct remittance network and today we promise uh, for a partner bank who holds account with the partner bank, money to be transferred in 60 seconds. Okay. So a piece, a small piece. We, it's not, we, we can't change the world in a day, right? So yep. a small step forward for at least targeting the biggest corridors first. Then we launched our MePay service, which is uh, domestic payments. If you are a customer of Emirates, NBD, or uh, initially we started with that, I don't need to know your account number, no beneficiary creation, using mobile number, I pay you directly. Then we started with, uh, okay, then we extended this to beyond Emirates and MBD customers. Using your mobile number, I can pay you without knowing your account number and without creating your, create, creating both in going through the process of creating a beneficiary. Again, a second step forward. Now working very closely with Central Bank, how can we transform the FTS to become, make it more real time? Like India's IMPS or UPI, and enable P2P payments, enable uh, eliminate cutoffs, and make it a 24 by 7 system. That's work we have to do very closely with Central Bank. Others, we are again experimenting on digital currency. So use blockchain not as a messaging platform, but use it as an actual valued platform. That's where the true function, value of blockchain comes in. All the use cases which we see are blockchain as messaging platform. Unless you have transformed the blockchain into a value transfer platform, that's the true value, true benefit of using blockchain comes in. Otherwise, yeah. it just becomes a press release. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I think the whole ICO hype over the last uh, 12 to 18 months has really uh, fragmented the blockchain, but underlying that, the actual technology behind it is, is fantastic. You know, general ledgers, the security around it, and I think the adoption of that is what is really gonna, gonna, gonna drive forward. This is what we do. We, we are not targeting on public blockchain we are completely on permission blockchains and we have a critical mass any distinct process which crosses multiple entities is where we can use blockchain as a secure data lake to tap on and as a single source of truth but between if you you have two parties blockchain is inefficient you don't have to use blockchain it's a, yep. uh, it's useless I think just leading into the final 10 minutes now, um, I wanted to discuss what the future holds um, for all of you guys. Um, I'll start with you, Namish, and interestingly enough, um, I was reading not so long ago a, a study from Goldman Sachs uh, in the UK saying by 2030 that 50% of the millennial, millennial population in the UK will not use a traditional bank account. I know you've touched upon the fantastic work you're doing in terms of innovating and, and working with fintechs to, to create an ecosystem and develop. But is there a concern for, for traditional banks and traditional financial institutions of what is going to happen? And what does the future hold for you? They, they should be concerned. If anybody says they're not concerned, then I think uh, they'll face the music in the future years. So uh, I think what we're, we're trying to be ready is that certain factors that today we use, for example, lending. Today lending is very, very traditionally based on FICO scores, right? We are trying to find out how can we transform ourselves and do lending based on other alternate credit scoring models, which Aisha mentioned, uh, maybe social credit scoring, maybe combining the FICO scores with social credit scoring, which helps us lend to people whom we were not able to earlier. That's lending. One is payments. How can, we, so how can we partner with people like Ripple or TransferWise and generally open the whole ecosystem? So again, that's a cooperation, right? Now, another TransferWise is going to uh, no, you know, disrupt us, so we don't, not, we're not going to cannibalize them, but we're going to partner with them. As an example, I mean, not that we have partnered with them, but it's an example. Uh, they, they'll have to become more nimble. I think open banking is what I see in 2030, franchise-based banking, where you, the bank becomes a platform and you're able to sell uh, an accounting package or buy an account from Bloomingdale. As, 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 a, as, as today as you buy Microsoft Office from a store, you'll buy an account from a store. The bank will become the engine and the power behind, but you'll have distributors and channel uh, distributors who would probably sell 
banking services. Fantastic. Aisha, for you, the future, what does it hold? I think it's, at least sitting in Singapore, there's so much growth in just our neighboring countries in Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines. Um, we see tremendous growth in both uh, the banking effort, the, the uh, traditional banks and their efforts to innovate and digitalize, and of course, in the growth of fintech startups. Uh, for me, I, I, when I started my AI solutions firm two years ago, a lot of C-suite people, CEOs, CXOs would want to talk to me, but they could not uh, articulate how data and AI could actually help them create better products and services for their customers. Now, within the last six months, I've literally seen a sea change. People are willing to experiment. And it's all about three month experiments and they are now beginning to roll them out. So for me, just seeing how quickly change is happening in front of my eyes uh, has, has been very promising and I see a lot more data driven financial services across the region. Fantastic. I, I look at it from a probably more of an ecosystem uh, level perspective, and I think you know we're we've achieved a lot, but we we, we got to stay grounded. You know, we just have to continue developing more and more. I think to Aisha, your presentation earlier, we're at a time where it's lifelong learning, and I think what we do now and going through all of this transformation changes the way that we think and handle things. The technology, the knowledge is always going to develop, but are we as individuals, institutions, and collectively wired in the right way where, you know, we can continuously adapt to change, continuously develop, and continuously stay in touch with whether it's our customers or, or the wider net. And I think this is important, and this is for me what happens now and what ha will happen moving on forward. Is, is what will set us, I think, apart and on that path to, to development. I believe we'll see more uh, fintech uh, be in mainstream financial services. We'll see much more engagements uh, beyond POCs and we'll definitely um, uh, continue to attract uh, investments and in, um, uh, VC deals in the region for fintechs. Um, the fintechs would take up to 8% of the financial services sector by in the next five years. We've, we've just run a report up from uh, 3% currently. Wow. So there's definitely a growth opportunity for fintech, but I just want to uh, add to a point you've mentioned that it took you two years to get that license. They have to prove themselves. We're all here pro fintech, but they have to be able to deliver on their promise. They have to have the right resources, the commitment, and the persistence and the ambition to actually serve their purpose. And if they believe in themselves, they will be able to make it in this market. But if they have an idea and then they fall after a couple of E's from EMBD, they will not be able to achieve that. I 100% back you up with that. I think it's very much a requirement to be able to prove yourself. I mean, I think we mentioned outside, we've been approached by a number of fintech, hub, fintech hubs in this region to come over and, and develop what we're doing. And we've always politely declined purely for the fact to be able to execute what we said we were going to yeah. do at home in the UK first before we, we think about expansion and delivering anywhere else. Um, that was that was really a, a fantastic discussion with all of you guys. I do want to open the last couple of minutes up to, to any questions from the floor. So if anyone has any questions, please. Um, oh, there's one. Is there a microphone? question is regarding the, uh, this intermediation of the banks with a lot of peer-to-peer -peer services. So as a bank, when you're examining the new products and services that you're launching, uh, you can see the uh, revenue and threat or the profitability of that threat for your current core services, be it on certain fees or uh, you know commissions and what have you. Uh, but are you able to see the opportunity that will offset that? I mean, you cannot stop it, obviously, because if you don't do it, others will. But do you see the alternative model, uh, the numbers making up for the shortfall of the services that are at threat? In some cases, yes. And in some cases, it's purely uh, uh, driving the 
it may not be it may not it may not drive revenues, but it may drive uh, customer engagement, which results in stickiness and retention. So one very good example I would give you is uh, we're trying to partner with a payment company, for example, where we know that this will cannibalize our FX revenue, but it will offset against some fee-based income which we may get, which is today is, a, is, a, is not a model. So that's an alternate model. But the, the bigger advantage is the customer's experience score. So that retention would probably help us, we assume, so there's assumption. Yes, absolutely. So FX is going, for example. Fee will increase. But fee may not completely offset the FX revenue, but there are assumptions being made on, uh, you know, and the assumption can, can come wrong, is that this will result in a higher retention and higher CASA balance from the customer, which will further offset what we lost in the FX model. One example. Uh, Zishan, there's a lady who wants to ask. I think, I think there's someone with a microphone at the back. Um, it is being passed around, so we will come to everybody. <laughs> I just have a question. As you mentioned on the technology and the blockchain uh, 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 now uh, on the, in the move, and in the, um, how do you uh, expect or anticipate in the future the the nature of the banking and the cryptocurrency? Would that will be superseding all this banking? And would we see any banking in the future, or only just digital currency? <laughs> I mean, I can't, I, I, I can give you my personal views. I cannot talk from the, the behalf of the bank uh, with cryptocurrency right now. I'm heavily invested in cryptocurrencies. I personally believe it, right? If banks will adopt it or if banks become uh, supporters of it, I have absolutely no clue. And there has to be some, you know, even as a personal, a personal investor, you invest in X, Y, Z. Z suddenly vanishes one day. Whom do you go to? Right? So there has to be some, there's a, there's, even as a retail customer, I don't have the confidence in that this will, it's all speculation right now. Unless there are certain regulations or distributed way, not centralized way, which recognizes this currency uh, or cryptocurrency as a valid value transfer, uh, value, store value, yes, things will move on. But today, I think the confidence level is very low. For example, there's one company I used to buy from India, uh, a lot of my investments. One day, it's shut down. I don't know where my money is. I didn't use my cold wallet to transfer everything out. So I've lost everything. After that, from pro to anti, I don't know where <laughs> do I stand right now. But from bank's point of view, I really have no clue where this will go. But starting point is digital currency. That may evolve into um, better support for crypto if you have some stable currency, uh, which is at least regulators get together and agree upon some MOU that, you know what, we recognize this and we accept it. Unless that, it's all speculation. Uh, I, I think there is a lady here as well who's got a question, but yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Muhammad Abdullah. CEO of Mal Wahalal uh, Fintech and Sharia Consultancy. And uh, I think uh, things have to go now uh, very in very speed because uh, what uh, has said about the blockchain is uh, uh, cryptocurrency is we see that now countries are making them. Now the Central Bank and Sama, they started working on it. I think the reason is that people are also fed up with the conventional way of dealing with them. We are no more happy with the dealers, with the, with the banks. They don't give us in return we what we want for, from them. We are hoping that, uh, inshallah, uh, people will stop depositing their money with the banks and uh, stop uh, you know, transferring their salaries to the bank. And then bank will improve because in FinTech now they are having really the alternative opportunities where you can go through the FinTech to the world wide. Amazon, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, everybody. This is the FinTech actually. 
Otherwise, the finance technology was not new since the computer were in, uh, invented. So since people are moving to these uh, giants, they can uh, put their salaries there, their deposits there, and then they can get good services and good uh, goods, uh, and also, you know, uh, uh, borderless uh, services whenever they need 24-7. Yeah. J just in interest of time, can we keep it to questions rather than statements, please? Yes. Salam alaikum. My name is Sosan Fikri. I have uh, just two questions. The first is, um, as far as I understand about FinTech, if, is it um, a sort of an incubator hub? I just need it to be summarized in one sentence. My other question, and the bigger question, is to Mr. Naimish regarding the banks and investments. Um, certain bankers from a certain bank, you know, had been goading me non-stop about investing in funds. Whereas they didn't do their due diligence, they didn't know that the, or they may have known, that the actual fund is very much, uh, you know, it's underrated. It is not even a triple A, it was not even a minus A, it was probably junk value. They sold it to me as a triple A fund, and two months later, my investment went down by more than 50%. Shouldn't the bank, isn't this the onus of responsibility on the bank as a custodian, which they charge me custodian fees for the investment, shouldn't they be more aware, shouldn't they be alerting the investment bankers, the people who sell us these funds, that they have a moral obligation to take care of our investments instead of seeing it watered down it's not hundreds of thousands, it's many hundreds of thousands. Isn't this the, uh, the responsibility, the ethics, and the morals of the bank? And shouldn't this be a central core of how these financial institutions operate? Thank you. First question? I'll prepare my answer for the second <laughs> <laughs> So we define FinTech as really using the technology to create new products and services for the financial uh, services sector specifically with a very appealing uh, customer uh, interface. So it's basically could be an application on your phone where you could go to a wealth management program and you can uh, invest uh, using a robo-advisor which is based on, for example, data and analytics that has been done through different sources and would give you a recommendation on which portfolio uh, to invest in. I don't know, Khaled, if you want to elaborate on the definition of FinTech. No, no, I, uh, I think you mentioned it. I always say FinTech is just, at least the way I see it, the use of technology to deliver financial services in a more cheaper, seamless, transparent and more efficient way. I think that's the base yep. definition of it, really. I would just add to that lowering the barriers to entry. So, you know, you could have invested in something that you understood a lot better for yourself based on the information and research that, that fintechs provide in a transparent manner. On, on your second question, uh, I'm with you on this. Now, I hope this was not our bank. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, I'm totally with you that if this, this is, the investors are your advisors. And if this is what they have done is completely unethical on that front. And uh, the only, and I'm, I'm shocked if this has been done uh, without uh, further study and without, without due diligence and they literally sold you something without value. I think as, a, as, as if I was in a place also, I would think it's unacceptable in that front. But how do you solve that? I think it's an escalation we need, we sh you should do. To your your relationship manager or uh, above them completely. I Maybe mean. you can help her name is navigate the system. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can, I can at least pass on this feedback and take your contact after this and then highlight it. Yes. Yeah. Hello, my name is Malik Greda. I'm an environmentalist. I'm glad that you transition into a cashless transaction at the banks. It means that they are not going to be trees cut to bring this money, and then uh, the dollar is not going to be the medium equivalent for transaction. I want to know what will be the uh, medium of uh, equivalent transaction if crypto is not an option. Thank you. Well, I think it would just be like, you know, a digital Durham in this case. 
and uh, you know be built on the same principles that crypto assets or cryptocurrencies are built but i think it it would be a national currency yeah, one is the currency today yeah. as well right uh, there are countries uh, in europe who have done it very well and they actually have a plan to stop printing bills we are not there i think our economy is still 75 percent is cash, cash. Though we are trying our best, right? Uh, you know, you have store value accounts now. You enable, uh, you know, instead of uh, you enable Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Pay. Uh, you know, you do phone-to-phone -phone payments. We're trying to reduce cash there. Post terminals are becoming more tap and go, fric less friction to the customers. But still, we are seeing 75% as a cash uh, element. One very interesting element. Uh, one, some, somebody told me why. And it was a perspective I had never thought about, right? So I was in uh, one of those uh, countries, and you know, being used to having cards and not carrying cash in your pocket became a problem for me. I went to buy something. They said, "Sorry, we don't accept cards, only cash." I said, "How come? In this world, you don't have a POS machine?" It was a reasonable shop. They said, "Boss, our mentality is that when you have cardless and cashless and everything, you spend more." When you see money in your account, money in your hands, when you're paying cash out, uh, we, we, we save more because the perception is when you see things and when you're actually paying cash, uh, you, are, you are in a better control of your money and saving. I had no answer to that, right? So they were living in some different world altogether uh, on uh, how are they going to change that mentality and perception. But we are doing our best in the current state to make uh, you know, transactions, uh, cash, as low as possible. But every year we see and measure, we're still at 70% cash. Hopefully, digital currency, if central bank uh, evolves that into, which further add uh, a higher percentage to reduce the cash. And slowly, slowly, slowly and steadily, it is about adoption. If everybody adopts mobile-based payments, then definitely reduce cash. So uh, let's hope uh, we, uh, we see that it's going to get launched next year and uh, st with a store value and a lot of other functionalities and a lot of merchant payments there might, might also resolve that. That is all we have time for. I just wanted to extend a thank you to Knowledge Summit for this fantastic event and to the panel for providing such great insight to fintech and everything great that's happening in this region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. أود أن أشكر مدير الجلسة والمتحدثين على هذه الجلسة المثمرة أما الآن فوصلنا إلى نهاية اليوم الثاني في ونهاية أعمال قمة المعرفة 2018 وهذه الجلسة الأخيرة في أوبرا المعرفة والتي أرجو منكم بعد قليل أن تتوجهوا إلى أرينا المعرفة إذ سيبدأ حفل الختام بعد قليل. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes the closing ceremony will start in Knowledge Arena. So, Knowledge Arena, yes. So, if you want to be part of the closing ceremony, please go to the Knowledge Arena. The closing ceremony will start in a few minutes. Thank you. شكرا لكم وأتمنى أنكم استمتعتوا. بهذا الزخم الكبير من المعلومات في قمة المعرفة 2018 على أن نراكم العام المقبل بالعديد من المعلومات والزخم العلمي والمعرفي هنا في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة وفي دبي مع السلامة